Welcome to the Being Known Podcast with my friend, Dr. Kirk Thompson. My friend, Pepper Sweeney. We are here to discover and explore what it means to be truly known. And today we are going to be looking at trauma and the body. Hmm. And uh, I am happy to be here with you, Kurt. Um, hmm. You know, these, these uh, recordings that we do mostly on Fridays are one of the highlights of my week. Me too, man. Yeah. Really, really great. Yeah. So tell us where are we going today? You know, I'm looking at, you know, uh, you've shared some notes with me for where, you know, some things you want to talk mm. about today. And um, there are words on this paper <laughs> in front of me that I really do not think are English. I, I don't know. I mean, the, these accented A's <laughs> and it looks, I feel like, I feel like we're going to be going into some Nordic, you know, I want to hear you say these words because I don't even want to try. <laughs> so oh if that God. doesn't entice people to stick around and listen to the podcast, I don't know what will. Oh my gosh. Uh, we have, we're just getting started. Holy cow. Well, um, you know, I am, uh, excited in particular about this episode because, you know, I grew up uh, in the field of medicine and particularly in the field of psychiatry. And we're, you know, we're trying to study the mind and we're taking care of patients who have all kinds of psychiatric impairments. And for, you know, it, it was really how interesting it would be that, you know, except when we were talking about you know, pharmacology, you know, what might an antipsychotic or an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication do, or maybe, you know, some kind of other intervention, uh, you know, electroconvulsive therapy or something of that nature. There just really wasn't a lot of conversation in my training about the role that the body itself is playing in how we experience our life. Now we kind of all know that. And of course, if you, you know, if you have a heart attack, we know it. if you break your wrist, you know it. But to consider the role of the body in the mind, in, in the development of the mind in the first place, uh, we begin to discover that uh, it's, it, it plays a huge uh, role. And, you know, the subtitle of today's episode, uh, then the Lord God formed the man, this, this uh, you know, our, our Christian anthropology highlights that when God formed us, he starts, he doesn't start with our thinking self. He doesn't start with our breath. He doesn't start with our awareness or consciousness. He starts with mud. Mm -hmm. Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the earth. He formed man's body and he begins this formation in a very intimate way. He's not forming it from a distance. He's down in the mud. The Hebrew text would indicate in Genesis 2, 7, that God's down in the mud, forming it with his hands and that he breathes the breath of life kind of like CPR into the man's nostrils. The man becomes a living being and the man can't become a living being unless he has a body. And therefore in many respects, we learn that our body, as it turns out, um, encounters things, uh, knows things as it were long before our thinking mind knows things. Anytime we're doing anything, when we walk across the floor, when we drive our car, when we, uh, have sex. Well, either our bodies are, are doing and knowing things in ways that our minds themselves don't always know them. And this follows along in our, just our general development. We start out with this, you know, two cells come together in conception, they develop into a zygote and it forms this thing called a neural tube. And at the end of the tube, there's this brain stem and the brain stem moves to our limbic circuitry. The brain stem we have in common with reptiles, the limbic circuitry we have in common with lower mammals all of which we would say like have bodies, but we don't imagine them to be thinking in the way that we're thinking. Eventually it comes to our neocortex, the part of us that makes us most uniquely human. And it's easy when we talk about trauma for us to think that we're really limiting our conversation to, you know, like what we feel and what we think and how I function in that sense. But today we really want to emphasize and, and look at the role that the body itself plays and what happens when the body experiences trauma as part of the mind, when the body is part of the mind experiences trauma. And one of the first things that we would say about bodies 
is that our body is formed in an intimate setting. Conception takes place as a matter of intercourse or, you know, in vitro fertilization, but it comes because people are being intimately connected with one another. So bodies are formed in intimate settings that that formation is a slow and intentional process. It doesn't just happen instantaneously for God to form the man. Like you form something out of, if you're going to mold clay, that takes time. And it's also conducted, that formational process in Genesis is conducted with the long-term intention for well-being of the one who's being formed. The well-being of the one being formed is kept in mind. And that's important when it comes, we'll see later what happens. Because when, when we're thinking about our children, when we're thinking about our friends, when we're being mindful of others, we're not just being mindful of them in the moment. Hopefully we're being mindful of them, the long-term well-being of them. I want to act toward them and toward their bodies with the intention of encouraging and their encounter with flourishing. I want to think about that. Trauma, as we'll see, does just the opposite. It, in an instant, does whatever it's going to do, and it's not thinking about them or their well-being at all. And then we get to later in the second chapter of Genesis, and we see that when God creates the woman, you know, he, again, God could have just said, hey, we're just going to take some more, uh, some additional mud, and we're going to do the same thing. But no, there is a certain kind of wounding that takes place. Now, he causes Adam to enter into a deep sleep, but he still takes his rib. He opens up a space. He takes his rib. He closes up the space. We sense then, and we see that in the text that God has the woman with him in some way, shape, or form for how long, we don't know. And then he brings the woman to the man, and the man responds with poetry and song. He's just had some kind of general anesthesia applied, and when he awakens, beauty and goodness is what he responds with. And this is something else that we would say that trauma does the opposite of when it comes to our bodies. Trauma leaves us in a heap of carnage. It doesn't bring us to places of poetry and song. In this way, trauma is in many respects the opposite in every way, with the exception of the context. The context is often an intimate context in which we experience traumatic events, but it's often sudden, not this deliberate, careful, mindful formation or surgical operation. It's sudden. It doesn't keep the well, it doesn't have the well-being of the victim in mind. And it doesn't have the long-term vision of beauty and goodness for all who are concerned in mind. The body then very soon as we develop is shaping the brain and the mind with all of its ascending messages, all the neural networks, all those neurons that run from your heart rate and your gut and your legs and your face and your hands up to the brain, shaping the brain, letting the brain know what we are sensing. And it's taking place long before the brain is actually able to make sense of all that that experience is taking place. You know, there was a series of experiments that were done with dogs, uh, Seligman and Mayer are the ones who did this experiment. And basically it, it created with these dogs, the, you know, the, what, what they call the encounter of the inescapable shock in that they would, uh, you know, they would shock these dogs, but in a situation in which the dogs couldn't escape from the provocation, there was no way out of this cage in which the cage was electrified and the dog was shocked and so forth and so on. And then they took those same dogs with yet another set of dogs. They compared these two sets of dogs and they took the new set of dogs and they put them in the same kind of situation with the exception that if they wanted to, they could escape. And as soon as the shock started, the new set of dogs ran out, ran away from this. But the dogs that had learned that they couldn't escape didn't leave the cage even though there was a wide open door. And in this way, we see that in our own lives, when we experience trauma, as we've defined it, we often discover that this is not a matter of mind over matter. It's the other way around matter over mind, that my body 
just like the dog's bodies, despite the fact that their mind could see an open door, their bodies did not move. Hmm. And so one of the things that we see that our trauma experiences do is that they shatter our perceptual capacity. Like the dogs were unable to perceive that there was an open door out of which they could leave. They had, there were other dogs we knew that they, they could see it and they left. They could no longer perceive things. And so this is one of the most, this is one of the most potent issues around trauma and our bodies that our body senses a reality in which it perceives its powerlessness. It perceives its inability to do anything. And so we find ourselves feeling like we're just stuck. We're going to be stuck with this particular sensation or feeling or image or, re or story that I'm telling. I'm stuck with that. And there's no way for me to change my perception of that. One of the ways I then cope with these kinds of things with my body is that I dissociate. Now, when we talk about this process of dissociation, we talk about this notion of how I leave the room. Now, uh, you know, dissociation is a thing that everybody does actually, right? When you and I are driving the car, we're, uh, when, when we are driving the car down the road, but our, you know, where you're, you're talking with Nell, who's in the passenger seat, you're having a conversation in some respects, you've actually dissociated to a certain degree from the active attunement to driving the car. And this is a good thing because this way, like your body can drive the car while you have a conversation with Nell. Mm -hmm. And this is a way that you can function and do what we might call some degree of multitasking, although you're not able to fully pay 100% attention to either one of them, which of course is why our wives, it's not a great idea to have really important conversations while we're driving the car. But we, 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 you know, we have, we dissociate all the time. We daydream, you know, we're, we're in a conversation and we somehow get distracted and we're thinking about other things. And they say, Hey, are you paying attention to me? I'm sorry. Like, did you say something? <laughs> I'm, I don't know. We, we intro the, the podcast, right? And we're, we're, we're in the middle of, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was dissociating. We're, we're in the middle. We're, we're in the middle of the Scandinavian yes. alphabet. Yes. We're, we're just going over some Scandinavian <laughs> words. Okay. So, so we find, so, so what we find ourselves doing, like we dissociate. And so in some respects, like the dogs are kind of, are, are, are doing this in a way they're dissociating. They're, they're not paying attention to what is real, but they have an open door. And in the same way we misperceive things, I dissociate, I cut off. And, and, and frankly, when we, we can, you know, as many of our listeners may, may have had this experience of having been in the middle of traumatic events that were so bad, uh, you know, your, you know, your combat experience or your experience of sexual harassment or mistreatment or sexual abuse, your physical abuse, you find yourselves in your mind going someplace else and you're not even aware of what's happening anymore. We often have a hard time remembering these events because the part of my brain that needs to be online in order to explicitly recall events as they're happening in real time and space, that part of my brain is not engaged. And so I don't recall things that have happened to me often, or is often very fuzzy, but my body, my body continues to hang on to this. And so we find ourselves often in these, what we would call inescapable prisons, just like the dogs do, but not because my mind isn't able to think my way out. It's because my body has been so overwhelmed and overpowered by the events themselves. Mm -hmm. There is a researcher by the name of Stephen Porges. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of his name, P-O-R-G-E-S, that is not Scandinavian, I don't believe. Um, but uh, he is a researcher, a neuroscientist, who back in 1994, so it's been a while uh, that he's been at this work, uh, he developed what eventually became known as the polyvagal theory. And we're going to talk about that. Is that one of those words? No, polyvagal was actually my fifth grade uh, <laughs> math teacher. Um, I learned a lot from Miss Vagel. She had a brother named Joe. <laughs> Joe Vagel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's going very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, his work uh, has really demonstrated the role of the body 
in the experience of trauma. And he begins by drawing our attention to what we commonly call the autonomic nervous system. Now, many of our listeners will have, have heard of this, maybe like in you know high school biology classes, this notion that there is the part of us, we the autonomic nervous system, we like to call it the automatic nervous system. Mm-hmm. We it's, it's a part of our nervous system that helps keep our heart beating, helps our breathing rate continue. It moves our GI tract, helps it do everything it's supposed to do. There are lots of things in our body that we don't have to command in order for it to happen. Like I have to command my hand to move. And we're all grateful that we've got this automatic, this autonomic nervous system. Right. And there are a couple of features of it, the fundamental way that it, it's involved in the development of our well-being has to do with two or three things. First of all is our fight or flight system. And we've all heard of this. This is part of our, it, it is housed in our brainstem. We like to call it our sympathetic drive system. And anytime we sense danger, we are going to do one of two things. We are, first of all, as animals, the first thing we would typically do, the first thing that all animals do if they're able is they will flee a situation. Mm -hmm. And if they're not able to flee the situation, they will marshal whatever they can to fight their way out of the situation. And that's one of the first elements of the autonomic nervous system. But the other thing that the autonomic nervous system provides for us in the sympathetic drive system is this process of providing us an accelerator and a brake. So it also like, you know, we get hungry for things and like I I go for food, like I don't have to think about being hungry. I, 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 that moves me towards seeking out food or my, you know, or water. Like I, I go for things. I see things that I'm interested in. My interest and curiosity is peaked. I don't have to just simply make plans to be curious. I don't have to make plans to be sexually aroused. Like those, these things happen. And my system, this sympathetic drive system, this accelerator moves me toward, I'm in go mode. I'm cur- It is part of the system that helps me create things. We want to make things. I'm interested, curious. I'm in movement perspective. But if I'm two years old and I'm running into the street, somebody has to put the brake on because I'm not going to do that by myself. And so we also have this braking system. It's the parasympathetic system. We have the sympathetic drive system. We have the parasympathetic system. And that will come into play in Porges's polyvagal theory. Now, all who are listening, I think like, why, why are we talking about all this stuff? It's important for us to know that... Um, you know, uh, we often think as, as we imagine and, and, and reflect on our own stories and our own traumas, uh, it's easy for us to wonder, why can't I just think my way out of this? Why can't I just come up with a solution for this? Why can't I just have a better understanding? And somehow I will cognitively figure this out and then make a different set of choices and then I'll feel better. The reason we talk about these things is because the more we pay attention to our bodies and how our bodies work, the more we can then live and work synchronously with our body. Because what one of the things that we know that trauma does is that trauma mucks around with this autonomic nervous system. Because if I'm afraid or if I'm worried, I want to be able to leave the situation just like the dogs wanted to be able to leave the cage, but they couldn't. What becomes of them? What becomes of us when we can't leave the cage? Right. This is where the polyvagal theory becomes really helpful. And the first thing that we, so when we keep in mind this autonomic nervous system, right? So we've got fight or flight and we've got the accelerator and the brake. And this notion that it really is driving us to be able to create things, to make things that we really want to do it. And it is in those moments when we are most interested in creating that we can become most vulnerable and we don't see trauma coming. If I'm in my foxhole with my, you know, with my automatic rifle looking for the enemy, like I'm, I'm far less likely to get hoodwinked. It's when I'm with the babysitter that I trust. It's when I'm on the date with the guy that I thought was going to be kind to me. It's when I'm in the church that I have been attending as a way for, to be spiritually nourished. It's when I'm, I've taken a job that I really love only to find that 
you know, it's like, it's practices are really hard. I mean, all the, the, the you know, the, the, the innumerable, you know, it's, it's this sport that I love only to find that I have a coach that only, you know, uses, you know, certain ways of traumatizing their players in order to get results. All these things I'm, I'm doing that I'm moving into this moment of creativity. And that's when these things happen that I'm not looking for. So one of the first things that the polyvagal theory teaches us is that we all, as human beings, we all have what we call, when we develop and you know, grow into what we call a, a, the, the capacity of our bodies to regulate our emotion. A lot of life, a lot of life, and a lot of what the autonomic nervous system does, it helps us regulate the things that we feel. And we have all kinds of emotions, pleasant emotions, unpleasant emotions across the spectrum. And we develop a certain capacity to tolerate a range of intensity of those emotions. We call that the window of tolerance. If I can maintain my emotional tone within that window of tolerance, it enables me to tell my story over time more faithfully. As we'll see when we get outside that window of tolerance, when my emotion is either too chaotic or too caught up rigidly, I don't have access to all the elements of my story that I need to be able to tell because the things that are important about my story always have emotional connection and tone related to them. So what is important about the window of tolerance is that it enables me to live in a particular range of emotion while remain connected interpersonally to other people. Newborns come into the world and they don't tolerate things very easily. They get tired, hungry, angry, and they are just wailing. They don't tolerate it very well. And over time, we would hope that when that, you know, newborn is 18 years of age, that 18 year old is not going to be wailing in the same way when it has to go to the bathroom or when it has to, you know, get a snack because it has learned to regulate move its emotional states within that window of tolerance. And we need this moving ourselves to states of integration. And it is absolutely contingent upon relationship interactions. I need the help of other people to help me learn how to bring my emotional states within that window of tolerance. And that's what secure attachment does in parenting. Now, along the way, as we learn to be in this window of tolerance, and then as we like to say, we like to widen it. As children age, we want those children to be able to tolerate more and more emotional experience without falling apart. This is why we would hope that the 18 year old can be able to tolerate certain emotional states. They're not getting rid of them. They're not denying them. They're not dissociating from them. They're tolerating them. They've learned to tolerate them even while they are in a certain emotional space, but they're able to do it because they have a sense of connection to people. That's what these interpersonal relationships are intended to do. And the system that is responsible for enabling us to widen our window of tolerance is what Porges has called and what other researchers called the social engagement system. Every baby comes into the world with a primitive social engagement system. This system is a collection of neurons that is spread throughout the brain, throughout the body. And it is what it says it is. It is a system that enables us to engage with each other socially. And we come to learn that the most effective way that I regulate my emotional tone is by my connection to you. If I'm upset and you come to me as my dad and I sense and see you're sensing me, I'm actually able to borrow your level of calmness and so make just it my the, own. So just uh, this week, um, my my daughter was, was uh, very emotional. She came to me, she was very upset about, you know, something. Hmm. And, um, she was like, I don't know. She said to me, I don't know what's wrong. Mm. Like I'm feeling, Mm. uh, you know, I have Mm. this. And so, um, I said, well, let's talk about it. So we sat and 
um, you know, I was able to talk to her about what, you know, what are the circumstances right now that you're going through? Where are the mm-hmm. stresses mm-hmm. coming from? Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to say, I get it. Mm. I, I, I understand what you're, what, what you're, why you, you would be upset. I understand why, mm. you know, and I just mm. want you to know that I'm, I'm here for you if you need mm. me in any way. Mm. Mm. And Kurt, mm. you could see, you could palpably mm. see the mm. change mm. happening in her, mm. you know, um, man, just the, the, the relief. And, and, you know, for me, I, I, t- I went to her later and I, I just said, thank you for, you know, coming to me and sharing, you know, what you were, that you were feeling something that you didn't understand, whatever. I said, I just, I just really appreciate you having those kind of conversations with me and being open to doing that. And right, uh, even just this week, it's just, it's just caused this whole different level of communication that we're having with each other. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been really, really a great thing. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I don't like that she's struggling in any way, but you know, you never mm. like to see that with mm. your kids, but right. Right. You li- it, it, it was thrilling that she came to me and we had conversations about it. Right. And so that's an, ex- that, that, that man, uh, can you be my dad? <laughs> oh, please listen. I mean, a, there's a lot to the fact that love, you know, heals a multitude of <laughs> sins because <laughs> I am, I, I would never claim to, I would never give parenting lessons, but I, mm. you know, I do. Well, I mean, that's, that's a perfect example of how, in 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 your attuning to her, you don't just uh, diffuse or get rid of her feelings. You provide an opportunity for her to better hold them, hmm. tolerate them. But she can now have the intensity of those feelings, and they can be there. And she might perceive them as she might perceive herself as feeling better not just because she no longer feels any of those things at all, but because she's no longer carrying them by herself. Right. And, and this conversation that you're having with me and you're teaching these things today, it's encouraging me to want, just want to do that more yeah. to, to want to continue those conversations because, you know, um, we need each other. People need each other to be able to, uh, get their emotions into their window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. um, and it just, is like, yeah, I can just, my presence and my sitting and being there can be of help is of help. Right. 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 Yeah. And, you know, um, we might say, uh, that you could have that conversation in person Mm. is significant because it literally means that her physicality gets to interact with your physicality. Mm. She is in the presence of you and your, you know, your six foot one, six foot two body, like, and in it, 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 it in and of itself, without even the words, it in of itself is communicating to her that you are there to hold and to, and to help provide a container for the stuff that she's feeling at the moment that seems to be spilling out all over the place yep. that she can't tolerate. And you're going to help her learn to do that. And yeah. so not only have you helped widen her window of tolerance, you've also literally strengthened the neural firing connection pattern of her social engagement system. Hmm. And it's that kind of human interaction that is necessary for us to grow those, widen our window of tolerance, enhance our social engagement system. And the other thing that's really crucially important about this is that, you know, we said earlier that our autonomic nervous system, that autopilot, it is constantly, its radar is constantly up looking for danger. And these kinds of moments that you're talking about with your daughter, it quiets that autonomic nervous system. It quiets it. Because if we are looking for danger, we cannot create, we cannot do stand-up comic routines, we don't experience joy, we are unable to offer reflections. Mm. We need those connections in order for creativity to emerge. I, I, in, order, in order to create, I need to not be wondering if you know the saber-toothed tiger is going to come and devour me. Right. 
And so to strengthen that means I strengthen my capacity for creativity. I strengthen my capacity for joy, for humor, for all of those kinds of things, for rest. All those things are necessary that, what, that we need this enlarged window of tolerance in the social engagement system in order for those things to come forward. And this is where we start to get down kind of into some of the more details of what poor just likes to say is this polyvagal theory. Like why, why do we, why do we talk about this? We talk about this polyvagal theory. Well, what's that word mean? So first of all, we talked about the fact that there are what we call 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And this might be, feel like it's, we're just getting a, you know, graduate level course in neuroscience, but it's helpful to know there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves, all of which are important for vital function by their vital function mediators. So our optic nerves for our eyes are like our, the, the, the third, the third cranial nerve for hearing and so forth. And so on my gag reflex, all the things that help us survive. The 10th pair is what we call the vagus nerve. And if you imagine we, there, there are pairs, there's a, a one on the right side, one on the left side of the brain, they come out and all the, the vagus nerve is, is such a big, important nerve because it innervates the entire series of hollow organs that we have. All of our viscera, we like to call our viscera, our hollow organs. So my lungs and my entire GI tract and my cardiac system, right? My, my heart is all innervated by this system because the heart, the lungs, the GI tract are also sending messages up to my brain. It is giving messages to the internal state of my body, to my mind at all times. So it innervates this, these hollow organs, which tells me a lot about what I'm feeling, a lot about what I'm sensing coming from my gut and my breathing and my heart rate. And the front part of this, if you imagine that this two branches that come out from a big tree trunk on the opposite sides of the tree trunk, the front half of each of these branches, the front part, the anterior vagus is what we call it's myelinated. And what's that mean? It's this protein sheath that wraps itself around it. And the reason that that's important is because the more myelin, the more flexible this part of the nerve is the more flexible. I mean, I can turn it on and I can turn it off quickly. And this anterior portion of the vagus nerve is part of what innervates what we call the social engagement system. This system that is actively engaging with others so that, for instance, if my son comes to me and he's mad about something with me, if we're connected because of this social engagement system, he can express his anger. I can receive it. We can talk about it. And then his anger can be resolved because it's using a part of the nervous system that is flexibly able to adapt because of all the myelin that's wrapped around it. And then it has a backside or a, what we call a dorsal vagus nerve, and it's not myelinated. And that's important because of what happens with shame, what happens with trauma, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So we have the front part of the vagus, we have the back part of the vagus, and in between, we have this sympathetic drive system, my fight or flight system. So if we imagine for a moment that there is an algorithm, there is a default system in which the brain operates with this autonomic nervous system in which we are designed optimally to be living in and working through the social engagement system. I'm living my day, living my life, connected to others. It doesn't mean that I'm perfectly happy. It means I could be sad, upset, just like your daughter. But if I'm living within the context of the social engagement system and a widening of the window of tolerance, it means that I can still, I can be upset and still be connected. And that connection helps me regulate that sense of being upset. And so I, if that's okay, but then I encounter something that is too overwhelming, an emotional event that is too overwhelming, just like the dogs in the cage, I default to my flight or fight system. I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to either flee if I can, like the second group of dogs were able to do, or I'm going to fight if I can. And so I move from the anterior portion of the vagus nerve and the social engagement system to my sympathetic drive system in my brainstem. That's default place. You know, I, that's the first place I default. But if I can't do that, if I can't move out of this situation, I then tend to move toward collapsing and collapsing 
is the very same thing that happens with mice and with possum when they are overwhelmed. We think that when a possum plays dead, they're like consciously sitting there, laying there on the side of the road, like with one eye open, looking for when the fox is going to leave. They're not. They're unconscious because their dorsal. Yes, this I see those. Yeah, come on. Come on. Talk to me. Well, <laughs> okay, I love my, this. We're in the we're in the middle of a serious sorry. trauma conversation. And my my daughter brought a cat home with her. She moved home for a while. She brought a cat home with her. And this morning, the cat caught its first mouse. Mm. Right? We have at, we at least it th- near, at least it thought near, it had. We live near well, right now I'm realizing that I put this mouse in a little Ziploc bag. <gasps> And it's sitting in my garage right now, thinking them out. But I don't think that mouse is dead. <laughs> well, it probably is now. <laughs> it, it might not have been when you put it in the Ziploc. But oh like, gosh. I, it, okay, it and, has, and Mel said to me, maybe it's playing possum. I'm like, mice don't play possum. Mice most certainly do play possum. Oh, well, now I know. Yeah. I'm not a possum, but I play one on TV. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is what will happen with animals that are overwhelmed and are unable to fight. Their dorsal vagus nerve system activates the sympathetic drive system that shuts everything down. It shuts your heart rate down. It shuts your breathing rate down. And when it shuts your heart rate down, blood leaves the central nervous system and you lose consciousness. And this is what a mouse will do. This Hmm. is what a possum will do. And it's not like it's now this waiting consciously. No, it will wait for the danger to pass. And it usually takes a long time. And this is something else that's usually that is important to know because it's not myelinated. When those nerve endings fire, they don't have the flexible capacity to fire in a different way quickly. When you and I are talking to each other, you're talking to your daughter, I'm talking to my wife, my son, or our friends or whatever, and we get irritated, upset, sad, or whatever, we respond flexibly because we're using the anterior portion of that vagus nerve. We're using the, the, this myelinated part that can actually adapt and it because it's, it's using other people's brains to do this. Mm-hmm. When I'm by myself and that dorsal vagus nerve acts, it does so in such a way that once it fires, it's going to be difficult to reverse that. And the reason that's important is because this, these are the rails that shame run on as well, which we'll talk about in our next episode. Shame run on these rails, which is why it's like you start to feel shame and like the, the situation can resolve itself and like you feel shame for days. Right. You can't get rid of it. And why is this important then when it comes to trauma? Because trauma overwhelms the setting. And it sends us into this place where we are even having to cope where like I'm, I'm constantly either in fight or flight mode because maybe that's all I'm, I'm, I can do that, but that's all I can do. Like, so I'm living in a house where my dad's an alcoholic. And, you know, I, it, it doesn't create collapse, but like I'm constantly on high alert. And, you know, our brains are meant to be able to be on high alert for short periods of time. Yeah, but not constantly, right. And once they collapse, I don't have a way of predicting how I'm going to be able to come back from that. And so we talk about how then trauma brings us into this place of what we would call terror, disintegration, dissociation, which we've already talked about, our perceptual shattering. We have what we call these repetition flashbacks that I find myself, I'm reactivating. And why is that? Because when my brain is overwhelmed in this way, and I'm now outside the window of tolerance, we call it either hyper or hypo activity. Hyper meaning fight or flight, hypo meaning collapse. Right. I'm not able to be creative. Humor doesn't help me. I can't be curious. a friend, his name's Roger, and uh, he was a pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon. I write about him in Anatomy of the Soul. And this was a guy who 
uh, when he was about 10, lost his two-year-old brother to a car accident right in front of him. And from that day forward, being the smart guy that he was, he just really kind of cut off his emotional states because his parents, they were unable themselves to kind of comfort I mean, they couldn't get them their own comfort, let alone comfort him. By the time that he came into my office in his late thirties, I mean, he'd already risen in the ranks. I mean, all this, this amazing academic uh, and surgical pedigree, um, but he couldn't parent his own two-year-old. He would lose his cool with his two-year-old. He wanted to have other kids and his wife's like, no dice. Like not until you like, you're like, you are a world renowned pediatric surgeon. But like, I can't afford, we can't afford to have another kid hmm. because the trauma of his unfinished business, this meant he, he had, he had taken a part of him that wanted to be able to flee, but couldn't. And all he could do would be to have that part of him was in, essentially collapsed. And then we think about Gail, this, you know, it entrepreneur who, you know, grew up in a house where again, just really things were out of control in her house and a father who was physically abusive. And I'll never forget not long ago in one of our confessional communities that she's part of, she started to name things that were taking place in her life as a young girl. And the things were coming to her lickety split that she hadn't thought about in years. And as she named them, she, she was sitting there like in the room and was just becoming oh, like becoming, you know, short of breath. Mm -hmm. And she turns and she needed assistance in the room at the time. And so in that moment, she, her, her emotion was her body. Right. So this is a person who was now moving hyper arousal, but she, what, what do I do with this? This trauma is like working its way out of her. Even after 25, 30 years, the trauma is working its way out of her while we're sitting there in the group. Hmm. And another group leader was able to stay with her long enough. And we ran some exercises with her in which, and all we did was we just had her pay attention to what we were doing with our bodies, how we were looking at her, the tone of our voices. We all, each one put our hand on our chests and we were just able to help her regulate, not because we were telling her anything. We just wanted her to pay attention to what she was sensing and what she was sensing us sensing. But to do that, we had to do what we could to widen her window of tolerance just enough to bring her back in, in order for her then to do what she needed to do to regulate those emotional tones and tenors that had exploded within her body and she did that in the context of this group. And then I think of Jeremy, my friend who was special operations. And he's now, I mean, for many of our audience, I mean, this was the first Gulf War. So a long, a long time mm -hmm. ago. And this was a guy who, you know, has seen, seen things that you just can't make this stuff up. And, um, and for the most part has very, even, even has very little sensation in his lower body, completely fit, completely capable, but no sensation emotionally in his lower body because he's so cut off because of the trauma. And so these are just three examples of what happens with folks and how healing, as we like to say, often begins at the beginning. Healing begins by first paying attention to our bodies in their over or under reactive states. For Gail in the room, it was just being where she was finding herself really upset, but being able to just say, yes, I'm, I'm upset. I'm, I, I can't do this. And we come to her aid and say, take a breath, look at me, listen to my voice, take your right hand and put it on your chest. She could do that. And now I want you to just feel, press, press on your chest just ever so gently. She could do that. And so she could feel her hand on her chest. Mm -hmm. And so she could feel her chest with her hand. And she could feel her hand with her chest, 
which are two different neural circuits. But for her to do that meant that she was bringing her attention back into the window of tolerance and using her social engagement system with me and with others to do it. And then I said, tell me what you see in my face. Tell me what you see. And she started to say what she didn't see. Well, you're not upset with me. I said, I, I, tell me what you see. I see kindness. I see your smile. I what, what do you, pay attention to that. So we're, we're inviting her body to work with my body and the bodies of others in the room. And so in this way, we're helping her move back into, in other, uh, other episodes, we've talked about this river of integration, moving mm -hmm. out of, out of, for her, the bank, off the bank of chaos into this river of integration. There are some other things that we can do. There's a exercise called the body scan that you all can, uh, you, you can, you can find this online in a number of different places. You, if you just Google body scan, there are multiple different places where you can get that. There is a breathing exercise that you can find on my website, kurtthompsonmd.com. There's a breathing exercise that will take you through for about five minutes that helps you connect with your body more effectively. We're going to talk in just a minute about another form of comfort in which we uh, tap ourselves on both sides of the body. We can just cross our arms, put our hands on our upper arms and just tap back and forth back and forth, back and forth. And at first glance, you're thinking like, Kurt, like, I don't know what the heck you're doing. But think about this. When you are comforting a newborn or an infant, I remember when I would hold my kids and they were upset, I would ever so gently, I would hold them and I would pat their bottom. I would just pat their bottom. There's a certain rhythmic sense, right? We are rhythmic people. And when we are either and we are outside the window of tolerance, we are no longer rhythmic. We are stuck in one place or another. Our body is in a prison of some kind of either it's on fire or it's collapsed. But to tap back and forth lets our brain know that we're coming for it, that it's not gonna be left alone. And tapping can be a comforting, grounding exercise. Walking with intention, not just pacing, but walking, saying, I'm going to go around my block two times. And as I do, I'm going to pay attention to what I feel when my feet hit the ground. Another exercise that we have for grounding purposes is we have people literally stand up sometimes and we have them gently or even firmly stamp on the ground to feel the weight of their body hitting the earth and feeling the earth coming back up through their body. So they feel this sense, because one of the things that we're doing with all of this is that we are completing the trauma cycles, physical escape route. I'm just going to walk through this real quickly because we're getting close to our time. Um, it's important to know that uh, when you, you'll, you'll watch this in, in animals in the wild, if ever an animal has been cornered, if it's ever been threatened by a predator, but the predator leaves it alone and the animal collapses, when the animal wakes up, you will find that the animal does not simply wake up and then just suddenly behave normally. It will wake up and it will start to shudder because what it's doing is it is enacting what it wanted to be able to enact, but couldn't because of the predator and it has to finish. It has to complete its cycle of trauma escape. If you were suddenly cornered by, if you were, if you were in a house fire and you're terrified and you get out of the house, you're relieved because your autonomic nervous system, your fight or flight system did exactly what it's supposed to do. It moves you out of that and you're afraid for the moment, but you move in response, just like the dogs in the cage that are shocked and they do move out of the cage. It's completing the cycle and then you feel better. Trauma, remember our sense that we are overwhelmed and there's nothing we can do about that. So we talk about this uh, completion of a trauma physical escape route through a number of different things. We talk about, um, First, you can, you can rate how high your stress is. That's a helpful thing to do for, as you think about different traumatic events for you rate. And then we, once you've done that, you can start to go through some of these, some grounding steps. We talk about this butterfly hugging 
and tapping that we uh, talk about. Um, we can do what I we mentioned. You can ground yourself by putting your feet on the ground, stomping lightly or heavily to give yourself some sense of your lower body being firmly rooted to the ground. Um, you start to notice your breathing slowly, gradually noticing your breathing, often putting your hand on your chest. Again, as I said, you can feel your hand with your chest. You can feel your chest with your hand. And then we begin to move toward discharging things. Once we've grounded, once we've supported this system, we want to discharge this. We want to breathe in a particular way that is strong, deep. Sometimes we breathe heavily, intentionally. You want to feel your breath in your stomach. You want to notice what any, any distress that you feel in your stomach. And again, we don't want you to judge whether or not you should or shouldn't be feeling certain things, but we're going to breathe hard. Next time, next thing we would want to do is you're just going to pay attention to what you feel, your emotional states. And then you want to pay attention to what you're thinking, what your thoughts are that are related to all these things, one thought at a time. And the next thing that we want to do as we, um, you know, as we get to the end of this discharge is we want to really have you reflect on what your resources are. Who are the people that you would want to have be in the room with you if you were going to do this? And that's a, these, these things are, are other resources in, the, in a number of the books that we've talked about. There are explanations for this in more detail, but we want, at the end of the day, remember, so much of my sense of being traumatized has to do with my sense that I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm alone. Mm. I'm just imagining your daughter, Pepper, and imagining if she were to talk to her friend later in that same day or the next day and describe what was it like for me to have my dad as a resource? Mm. How did having my dad speak to me in the way that he did and be with me in the way that he did? How did that help me have a completely different outcome? for my day than I would have had, had he not been there. And this then brings us right back, I think, uh, you know, to one of our grounding texts that we've pointed to John 16, 33, these things, Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you so that in me, you may have peace in the world. You have tribulation, but take courage. I've overcome the world. To be in Jesus, as he says, so that in me you will have peace. To be in Jesus, first and foremost, is an embodied activity, not a disembodied spiritual one. Who are the people that are enabling you to imagine that Jesus' body is present and with you in the same way, Pep, that you were with your daughter? Second, to be in Jesus is to be then in his body of believers. Who are the people that are going to be with me then? And to be connected via our physicality engages our social engagement system, bringing us back into our window of tolerance. So this week, our exercise for the week, mm -hmm. real quickly, um, uh, one thing you can do is just locate uh, on the uh, on my website, Kurt Thompson MD. Uh, there is a, a we said we mentioned there's a breath exercise in the reflections page, and I would say practice this exercise once every day, and just start to pay attention to what you sense in your body as you're breathing, not only during the exercise, but also at other times during the day. Uh, begin to notice not just what you sense, but how you respond physically when you're in various settings. And as you do, be curious about how long you recall sensing or feeling what you're doing. Again, it's drawing our attention to our body. And in this way, we are increasing our degree of integration. Not only do you pay attention to what you sense and feel, but also what are your thoughts? What's the story that you're telling about these and how are they related perhaps to other stories where you felt these things before? Um, we mentioned the body scan exercises that you can locate on the internet that can help you be more connected to your body's response. And this is intended to increase your awareness as well. And always, as always, uh, should you start to feel more uncomfortable at any time, uh, we really want to encourage you to seek help uh, from a close friend, a pastor, or a counselor. Um, as we've said before, this is our, our podcast is not a substitute for that kind of work. And we know that many of you who are listening to this um, are in places where that kind of work could be really helpful and necessary. And so, uh, Pepper, I, I just I just realized that um, I think I'm tired after this hmm. conversation. Yeah. I think I'm tired. And I think about the stories that have been moving through my mind. I, I think about the amount of uh, work that we burn, not just telling these stories, talking about this, but also just imagining um, 
how our talking about these things can evoke things in other in, in our listeners uh, that, that can have them be tired too. And so uh, we also say that when you do this kind of work, sometimes your body says, I'd like to take a nap. Uh, and when you hear it say that, uh, it's those are good words to pay attention to. Yeah. Go grab that weighted blanket. Yep. Right on. Yeah. Right on. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks for today. Thanks for everything you shared today. It's uh, mm. helpful. Just Lots. helpful. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, got, um, uh, go ahead. I've, I've got to go because I've got a mouse to go tend to. Okay. <laughs> uh, and we will be, and, and we'll be offering the, uh, the post test in Swedish. Yes. Um, Those of you done. watching on uh, YouTube, uh, stand by because Amy's going to join us. We're going to have a little post show conversation. Very good. Love See you, man. You too. See ya. Holy cow. Whew. I need a nap. Yeah. It's a lot. I mean, it's I mean, it's a just lot. a lot of information. It's a lot of information. And I, you know, and it's intense. I, yeah. And I, I'm aware that, you know, I, well, in my own mind, I, 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 uh, you know, I, I, I want, I, I, I think we're, we're working to try to find a way for these things to be helpful and useful for folks and not be overburdensome and just like downloading information. And so I think I, I think I was probably, I think I was probably a little worried about that. Well, I think this, the this time the information is such, I mean, it's a component. We need that information, right? We can talk about things, but the information is super helpful. Hmm. And then okay. like, I think, oh, okay, I'm going to go back and listen to that because there's so much information, but Pip. I was going to say, if, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. If you, um, if you hadn't given information today, I, I wouldn't have thought about what happened with Hannah and I mm, mm. the other night. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. I mean, huh. It, it, cool. and it taught me and is encouraging me to do more. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Um, and to that point, Kurt, I mean, Pep, when you talked about that conversation, um, like one of my mentors, she will often say, I'm holding this with you. Like there's no real solution to be had. There's no, it's just the weight mm -hmm. of something. Yeah. And if somebody says, I'm holding this with you, like I can hold a lot of things of other people's. Like, yeah, I can do that. And so, but to hear somebody say that, then it's like, okay, whew. like, yeah. The burden, the weight of it gets eliminated almost immediately. Yeah. Yeah. It's an imperfect um, metaphor, but I think about like, you know, you pick up a five gallon bucket of water and I mean, you can do that, but then, you know, it doesn't take very long before it really starts to get uncomfortably heavy. And then if somebody says, well, here, let me, let me just hold it with you. And as soon as somebody else like grabs half the weight. Yeah. Like you feel it. And if the, yeah. you know, and if it were something bigger than that or whatever, where you could do it and, and a third person walks in and says, well, let's, let's hold this together. Yeah. And so like, I'm serious, this experience that I had with the, with the member of the, of the group, the confessional community, mm -hmm. like the intensity with which she was holding her own distress that was just kind of like really overwhelming her in that moment. It was absolutely stunning to me to watch what happened over the next like four to six minutes as she first just paid attention to me mm. and she and, I, and she's trying to match my breathing and we're just slowly and then i said when you're ready i want to invite you to simply start to look around the room at the other people's at the other people's gazes and one by yeah. one, one by one. And I'm watching her while watching. she's watching the others. Uh -huh. And you watch it. It's, it's like watching, I don't know. It's like watching some body of water go from this chop to just, you, it, it, you just yeah. watch it plane out. Yeah. And it was striking to me to see what the body of Jesus was doing on her behalf, because everybody is like leaning in and saying like, here, I want a hand on the handle. I'm, I'm going to help hold this. We're all going to, we're all going to help hold this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now, you know, it's like an eighth of the weight. I mean, that's imperfect, but yeah. 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 
Um, another yeah. thing I thought about, okay, hearing about the dogs was troublesome. I, and I, I don't, th I think it'll be troublesome to a lot of listeners, um, but this was done in 1967. Is that right? Or ish? It was done a long time ago. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, I, I mean, it's troubling that this, that part of it, but like, but I immediately thought, oh my gosh, in the context of community, we tell our people, we tell our friends there, the door's open, right. the door's open. Right. Right. We, we do. And fathom that idea, but I see that it's open. We don't have to get up. We don't have to do anything right now, but. And it's very, it, and, and, and it's, it's very difficult for our friends to move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like they, yeah. Pat. No, it, it just made, it just got me thinking about people that are in abusive relationships that don't yes. leave them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and if we move to action, because I was with some friends, one friend said, told of a rupture her boyfriend had created. And immediately we were all angry and protective and wanted to, we resisted the urge to move to action. Like, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to mm -hmm. end this? You should end this because this is clearly whatever. We, we all had thoughts, but it's like, if you move to action, you miss what's, what's happening and what's going on. Cause, cause if I can just say the doors open or what do you see as other options, then it's this slow, this cadence of, I don't even know what processing or. Right. And, and the thing is that if, if, if we move to action too Before. soon, mm -hmm. We're actually preventing their own cycle from being yeah. completed, right? Because mm -hmm. we're doing the work for them, but their like their body needs like to get there. They actually have to get there on their yeah. own in order for them to complete the cycle. Right. Right. It's, it's like one the thing. Abusive. No, no, no. Go. Right. No, it's it's one thing, uh, and 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 it depends upon you know what. You know, you know, it's it's always tricky because it, it we are always trying to find the line between, you know, who is and who is not capable of moving, mm -hmm. right? Like you're in a fire and you've got three toddlers in the house, like you pick them up and go. Like yeah. you don't say, hey, you know, here's you don't tell them to go, like because they're not capable of doing certain things. You pick them up and you go, mm -hmm. but you know. And, and so, and, and, and so there are certain times when we say, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've had moments, they're very infrequent, but they're, you know, because usually you're asking questions like, well, what do you want to do with that relationship and how, what are the things that you can imagine and what, all those things. Right. It's uncommon, but I have on occasion said, here's what I'm going to recommend that you do. I'm going to recommend that you, I strongly recommend that you consider having no free, no more contact with that person for at least the next six months. Right. Mm -hmm. No contact. Right. And I'm not very, I'm not often very directive like that. Yeah. But there are times, there are times yeah. when they need to hear it. Right. And Just not because they're actually even, for safety right. For and not even because necessarily they're going to do it that day. Right. But because they need to hear that somebody else is speaking that strongly on their behalf. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where sometimes it is helpful to hear someone's anger. Yeah. Because, like, right. oh, okay. It is appropriate. It, it does make sense that I'm angry. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's good. It's uh, in in our in our men's group that we run. It just ha this happened just this past week where there was, um, you know, one person was telling his story, and you know, two or three others. They're like, they're like, tell me where to find the guy. Yeah, I'm gonna cut like they're they're, they're they're like they're just so they're so angry, yeah, on behalf of this person, mm -hmm. and this person is like, I don't, I don't really get it. I don't really, I don't really get it. And they're of course like, you don't get it. How do you not get it? And over the course of the evening, it was this you know remarkable transition for how they were able to express his, they, in other words, the anger that they were expressing didn't just belong to them. It was, it belonged to him, mm -hmm. right. but he couldn't have, he didn't have access to it. But as they started to name it, 
and he could see it outside of his own skin. You could see him becoming moved from this place of like being puzzled yeah. mm -hmm. to this place of being uncomfortable to this place of like feeling it himself. Right. And then of course there's like, but now, you know, I've, I've, I've spent the last 20 years working really hard not to pay attention to this. And now that it's now, now that I've allowed my eyes to open see that it's in the room. Now it's now I know why I haven't been paying attention to it for the last 20 years. Right. Cause now I don't know what Here to do with go. it. Right. And so we say, well, we're going to come back about, we're going to come back next week and we're going to talk about it again. And, we're, yeah. and, we, and it's not just talking about it, like we're, you'll figure out what to do with this eventually. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah. first you need a space. You need to widen your window of tolerance. You need right. to be able to hold it in order for you to discern what you're going to do with it. Right. Right. And that progression is important. Yeah. 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 It's good. This podcast is produced by Kurt Thompson, Pepper Sweeney, and myself, Amy Chella. Audio production and editing is by Keaton Simons. Video production and editing is done by Mark Gould. If you'd like to connect with us, you can find us on social media at Being Known Pod. If you like this podcast, tell a friend. If you love this podcast, tell everyone you know. And please like, rate, and review wherever you listen. Be well, be now.